and a warm greeting friends to another episode of the Mystic Discoveries podcast. Today I'm talking with Mary Stewart Adams, a star law historian who, taken from her Instagram bio, is restoring the mythic grandeur of knowing the stars. Whether you're a seasoned astrologer or a newbie to astrology, astronomy, astrology or astrosophy, you will definitely find this chat of interest. We discussed the three I just mentioned, astrology, astronomy, and astrosophy, and how the three disciplines are connected, but how they differ, and how we can work with all three to reconnect with the starry heavens. To begin with, Mary shares um, with us her story, how she came to walk her spiritual path and develop her way as a star law historian. She has studied and worked personally with um, astrology, astronomy and astrosophy for many years and has some wonderful nuggets of wisdom to share with us today, both in her personal story and um, in the wisdom and uh, knowledge she has about these practices. In the second part of the show, Mary goes into more detail about astrosophy. She goes into the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn and why it's such a big thing that's happening in December this year, 2020. She also talks about the eight-year cycle of Venus and where we are in relation to that. Uh, she talks about how astrosophers calculate the prenatal birth chart or prenatal chart um, and briefly describes the journey that we human beings take from the heavens down into our earth incarnation. I also ask her, am I a Gemini according to tropical astrology or a Taurus according to sidereal astrology? She, um, well, spoiler alert, she explains why I am both. And honestly, I felt like I was being treated to an epic storytelling event. Mary has such, an, such a way with words and an enthusiasm for reconnecting, with the, reconnecting the human being with the stars that I challenge you to not be inspired to take on a personal study of the cosmos yourself after hearing this. One of the key things in Mary's life has been freedom. And I really appreciate the way that she approaches her working with a discipline, astrosophy and astrology, which could really easily allow the person who's working with it to put them and others into boxes and to limit their development due to where the stars were at moment, at a moment of birth or in a moment of time. Um, a massive thing I learned was that it's not an either or, but an all approach when working with the stars. Uh, and actually, that's what I like about anthroposophy or spiritual science, actually. I'm noticing that this is a truth, too, that you don't have to eliminate a belief system or ways of thinking, but you can work to incorporate it and integrate everything that feels true for the individual. One doesn't have to think about it think about things either scientifically or spiritually but you can think about things um, in both ways and integrate the two uh, and this is just kind of like a side thought which is true for me at the moment and I just thought I'd share that. So I encourage you to follow Mary's advice and go outside on the next night that all the stars are out and become familiar with them. I'm going to start doing that. Uh, we are at a point in human evolution where it's up to us to reach out and connect with the stars again. They once spoke to us and then they went silent and now we must speak with them. So enjoy the podcast. Let me know uh, what you think. Please like, subscribe and share and all that kind of stuff. If you're listening on iTunes, it really helps if you can give it a five-star review and or leave a comment because it helps bump it up so other people can see it. Um, and if you want to become a patron to help pay for the running costs, it would be great. You can do that from as little as a dollar eleven a month and it just helps pay the bills, <laughs> really. And you can do that by going to Patreon slash The Mystic Discoveries 
and I'll put a little link in the show notes so that you can go be a patron and support um, me creating all these fun podcasts. But yeah, aside from that little promo, enjoy the podcast. Um, yeah. And thank you again, Mary. Welcome to Mary Stewart Adams. Thank you for being on the Mystic Discoveries podcast. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure. Yeah, very cool. Um, I have a Māori karakia, or prayer, that I often start the podcast with, which I could um, speak today. Or if you have a verse you'd like to share, you're welcome to do so as well. I would really love to hear your verse, if that's all right. Yeah, very good. Variant. Yeah, happy to do so. I'll say it in Māori first, and then I'll say it in English. Okay. Whakatakate ho ki te uru, whakatakate ho ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti he Māori ora. And in English that is, cease the winds from the west, cease the winds from the south, let the breeze blow over the land, let the breeze blow over the ocean. Let the red-tipped dawn come with a sharpened ear, a touch of frost, a promise of a glorious day. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm. That's really beautiful. Thank you. No, thank you. I always find it's nice to kind of open the space with a with a verse. Yeah, by, by centering in the space, right? Yeah. yeah. So Mary is here uh, to talk to us about the stars what's a good way to phrase how would you phrase it do you say that you're talking about astrology astrosophy what do you say that you do you know i have a hard time i have a hard time defining myself as an astrologer or as an astronomer or as an astrosopher mm. um, but i i definitely use all three in my work so this is um it's because of this that i refer to myself as a star lore historian so the same way we have folklore, um, so the story of the night sky is what I'm about. And I look for those stories, not only in the ancient practice of astrology and then in the astronomy of the scientific revolution or the astrosophy that's introduced really by Rudolf Steiner in the 20th century, I, I look for stars everywhere. Mm. And I give myself the freedom to, to, to look in the news or in fairy tales or in history. Um, I'm just trying to always be sensitive to what is our relationship now. So it's hard to really pinpoint, you know, I can put on my astrology hat, then I can put on my astrosophy hat, then I can put on my astronomer hat. Um, I like to not wear any hats and just be who I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. Right? That's great. So you're here to talk yeah. to us about that. But I was thinking we could divide our talk into two parts. And the first one would be great to hear more about you and your journey Um in terms of uh, what what spiritual path you've chosen and how you've come to be the person you are. It's a big chat, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but maybe yes, just <laughs> briefly. And then in part two, um, we could talk more about astrosophy and astrology yes. and astronomy because I think a lot of us um, are quite well aware of either astrology or astronomy. Um, but when I personally found out about astrosophy, I was – quite blown away by it and um, there aren't heaps of resources out there so I think it would be great for people to have a kind of intro into that realm um, yeah wonderful. yeah cool yeah the, the two things kind of go together because of the way it happened in my destiny path so hopefully we'll find a nice segue I think we will it'll be nice yeah so let's go yeah. on into your life Mary could you right. share, could you share with us what your childhood um, and early adult life was like? Yeah, so I grew up in Michigan, and Michigan is surrounded by water. The Great Lakes are here, and some of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world are here. And even when you look on a map, it might not look like much, but the, the Great Lakes are quite large. Mm -hmm. And um, so just to give you a sense of the environment that I grew up in, but I'm the, I'm the seventh of eight children. Wow. And what, it's not unusual to have a family that large at that time, but what was unusual is that we were all born with 10 years. And <laughs> so my mom, my mom had been 
in her adult life really committed herself to her path of Catholicism. But then the 60s came along and she really went through a crisis in her faith. Mm -hmm. and she left the church. This was after she had her sixth child, and she was trying to raise her children with this kind of uh, discipline that was coming through the Catholic Church, and she just it just didn't work for her anymore. So she went through a crisis in her faith and left the church, and then I was born. Mm -hmm. So I was raised outside of any kind of religious training um, and really left free in that realm, except that, you know, well, I mean, not accept that. But what happened was I ended up going to my church experiences were always with somebody else going with someone else's family right. and where they might have to go to Sunday school or have to have teaching. I could be there freely to just observe and take what I wanted and not have to abide by anything. You know, when you're, you're young, you're kind of following the rules. But so mm. I realized now in my life, as I look back, that that was for me, at least quite unique that I got to see what the Protestants were doing. And mainly it was Christian religions while I was a child, but then as I got into my teenage years, because of the type of schooling I received, I then met people more from like the near and Middle East. Um, so Iranians and Iraqis and Jewish folks and Turkish, Turkish people. I mean, then I started to get more exposure to other religions, but um, that was a really interesting part of my biography that mm -hmm. at the time I wasn't paying any attention to. But so I also, as the seventh of eight children, was left to myself a lot, yeah. which I think meant that I was able to really develop an imagination pretty freely because nobody was answering my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of made up little ditties for myself about yeah. things. And I remember I invented an alphabet for myself because I really couldn't wait to learn letters and how to read words were always very important to me and in fact the word important when I learned that word I remember saying to my mom aren't you glad that I can use big words like important now so that we can have conversations like so that Aww. we can talk like big people talk yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's sweet <laughs> yeah and and one of my earliest memories from childhood I was probably only three or four years old we had gone to visit the family of our, our former neighbors. We had moved out of the neighborhood, and my mom took us all back to visit. And the children in this family were the same ages as my older siblings. So, again, we went there, but then I had nobody to engage with, so I'm just left by myself. Mm -hmm. And I went out into the garden, and there was a little grotto built there with a statue of the Virgin Mary. And I was having a conversation with her the way a child will have a conversation, which is that it's quite real. Mm. And we were planning our wedding. Aww. And at a certain moment, the, the mom whose house we had gone to visit, she saw me out in the garden and thought that I was playing with her statue and came screaming out of the house. And I think this is the only reason I remember, because I was so shocked that I was being yelled at for having a conversation with this being. Mm. I wasn't talking to a statue in my childhood imagination, which was very real. Um, and so that's kind of a theme that played out in my life of having this kind of conversation that the first step of it seems to be a very vivid and living imagination. And by that, I don't just mean make believe, but the kind of thinking that we need when we're trying to access the unseen world. Mm. So when you're three years old, when you're nine years old, even when you're 19, at least for me, I didn't know that that's what I was doing. Yeah. Um, but I, so I received a very good uh, private high school education, and then um, I went straight to college. I, you know, I, I took a semester to deal with a broken heart over my first love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but then I then ended up um, at college, and I wasn't. I wasn't really in a situation where anybody was saying to me, you have to go get an education so that you can become a particular type of professional so you can get a certain job and earn a certain amount of money. That wasn't happening. I was just left free to pursue what I loved. And I remember calling my mom once to say, well, I have to declare a major. And what do I do? And she said, just do what you love. So what I loved was literature and art history and mythologies. So I was really... Um, encouraged to pursue what I loved. 
And I'm really grateful for that because not everybody is given that opportunity. But when I, at this point in my life, when I look back, I think, wow, you know, mm-hmm. I, it didn't make it easy because there's a lot of questions that are unanswered. But so I went, you know, through, through high school, through college, and then I um, moved to New York City for a couple of years to run a business for my dad. And that was a bit of a trial by fire because I had a degree in literature. Yeah. No, no business sense. <laughs> Hadn't taken math since high school. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> so now I was living in Manhattan and running a modeling agency, and I had to learn kind of overnight how to negotiate rates for models, and it oh, was wow. very fast-paced, and I, you know, just very, very high stress. I lasted for two years, and then I called my dad, and I said, look, I, I want to come home. I, I want to do this. Yeah. Gosh, that would have been such an interesting um the modeling industry in New York. What an extreme. Yeah. In the 1980s. God, yeah, oh my was, God. Yeah. So I had, while wow. I was at co- in college, I worked as an editor at the university newspaper right. and my, my plan was to become a journalist. So I had some pretty high profile internships like with Rolling Stone magazine and cool. CBS records and NBC in Detroit. And I was going along that path. And then my dad said, well, why don't you go, you know, go to New York and run this business for me. So the high profile nature of it was something I was accustomed to, but I wasn't used to having to negotiate modeling rates and set up bookings for all the girls. And they were, you know, they were all of them older than me and their livelihood depended on my ability to be really savvy in negotiating with clients. Yeah. And that was, that was intense. Mm. Um, and so while it sounds glamorous, it's not necessarily all it's cracked up to be. Yeah. And I, what I felt at the time was that there were people who wanted to be around me, but it was because of what they thought I could offer rather than wanting to be around like me as who I was as a person and an individual. Mm. So it felt really superficial and I just wasn't satisfied with that. So I, I told my dad, I came home and I said, I, I'd like to go to graduate school to get a degree in library science. And he just laughed at me. He said, <laughs> With all the things you've done in your life and you want to be a librarian. And yeah. I just, I needed to settle it down. Like I needed, I needed some quiet and I needed to regroup mm. um, because New York City had been a pretty, um, it's really exciting. It's very dynamic, but it had been, a, I, I often refer to it as a trial by fire. Mm. I can see why. Yeah. So and then, yeah, I came home and I got married and started a family and I never finished my graduate degree. But so that's pretty much, yeah. Yeah. It's one way to tell my story of childhood and early adulthood. No, it's, it's a good, it's an interesting picture. Thank you for that. So yeah. within all that, how did you come to find um, anthroposophy and astrology and all those things? Yeah. So when, I mean, and, this is a good question, and it's why I started with the fact that my mom had left the Catholic Church because right. it's part of, part of the story. Mm. Because at the time, she tells the way she tells the story is that she had a sense that there was something coming, and she didn't know what it was, but she wanted to be prepared for it. She wanted her children to be prepared for it. Mm. So when I was eighteen, which is just just around the time of the first moon node. So the first time the moon node comes back to the exact position it held when you were born, a friend of mine gave my mom a book that led to my mom going to a particular bookstore where she shared with the owner of that store that she was having really unusual experiences, almost like uh, ESP. Right. She was foreknowledge of certain things. And she said, something's happening. I feel like I'm on the edge of knowing something. And the the gentleman that owned that bookstore said, well, you're ready for Rudolf Steiner. (laughs) And so she was actually there looking for a book on astrology because she had, through a course of mishaps, ended up taking an appointment for a friend with an astrologer and had her chart read, and she didn't really believe in it. Mm -hmm. You know, it had been 20, almost 20 years since she had left the Catholic Church. And um, but then the things that this woman told her were so remarkable. So she was looking at astrology and was introduced to the work of Rudolf Steiner at the same time. And now I'm like 18 and a half. My mom brings these books home and I just picked them up and looked at them. And I was, the astrology was really easy to get a hold of. It's like, oh, I get it. It's like a, kind of like a living jigsaw puzzle. Saturn means something 
in and of itself. And if you put it here, it means one thing. If you move it over there, it means another thing. Like I get it. Yeah. And then I looked at the Steiner and I was like, this is some really weird stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't like it at all. And, but I have, um, I have five brothers and two sisters, but my two sisters are six and seven years older than I am because they're, they were born at the top end of the family. I come along at the bottom mm -hmm. and my sister Pat and my mom, they, we're always into the same things together and they also always drank coffee together and I was really jealous of their relationship because in a healthy way though not in a not in a bad sibling rivalry kind of yeah. way it was just I want to be I want to be a part of that and mm. I you know I'm always trying to be in the conversation and words were really important and so they were always talking about Rudolf Steiner and I looked at this book and I thought gosh this is so weird but they're really into it mm. and if I want to have, if I want to talk with them, I'm going to have to figure out what this is. Yeah. And so it was, you know, I, I longed, I didn't like coffee. <laughs> uh, they drank coffee together every day. I was like, I just, just want to be part of it. <laughs> so that longing for relationship with them was a big motivator for me. Mm -hmm. It seems really strange, but I mean, it was quite personal. Mm -hmm. And so I started reading and studying the astrology came much quicker than the anthroposophy. Mm -hmm. But then, when I started to have my own family, the when I started having children, then the anthroposophy became very important to me. Because of the human development, the child yes. development stuff? Yes, because yeah. now I was conceiving a child mm -hmm. and this idea that there's a destiny unfolding and we need to create environments within which the soul that's coming can bring their gifts. And, anthroposophy had the stuff that I wanted in order to receive the children that I was bringing into the world mm. um, I made you know at that time I already knew how to cast charts and read horoscopes but even still I've kind of made a commitment to myself to not get too deeply into my children's charts because I need them to be free yeah and I don't want them to be burdened with my interpretation of what their lives will be just because I've been looking at their charts mm. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I continued to study the astrology side by side with anthroposophy. And I didn't, I didn't really see that they, it wasn't that they were separate, it's just that it hadn't even occurred to me that they could go together. Mm. Now, even though I made a big deal out of the fact that my mom left the Catholic Church before I was born, I did spend two years of high school in a Catholic all-girls boarding school. Right. And it was more for the education because the school system where we lived was not great. So it was more to get a good education than it was to get religion. Nonetheless, I had to take scriptures every day. So I learned the Bible, although I was a teenager and I wasn't really interested in that. Mm. So I had this kind of latent knowledge. Yeah. I also was learning astrology. I also considered myself in my 20s, once I started having my own children, to really have my feet on the path of anthroposophy. Right. And then I never went to any lectures or anything. I just studied with my mom and my sister. We mm -hmm. just kind of shared books, and it was, so it was just very personal, very intimate between us. And then an astrosopher came to town, and I had never heard of astrosophy. I didn't know what it was, yeah. but she was going to talk about the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter that was happening in May of 2000. And so this was in 1995, so five years ahead of time. Wow. And it's that she, big a deal. You would talk about it five years ahead of time. It's a big deal. It only happens every 20 years. It's happening mm -hmm. again this year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was like, wow, that's great. I know about Saturn. I know about Jupiter. And then she was linking it to the conversion of Saul at the gates of Damascus, which is, you know, a story that's in the Bible. And I'm like, well, I know that story. I mean, I don't know how these two things go together, but I'm going to go. Mm. So I went to this lecture, and when she began speaking, I almost, like, rocketed out of my chair. I was so excited. Like, mm. you, mean, you mean all of these things go together? Wow. The, the, the astrology goes together with the anthroposophy and this you can find like the deep mystery behind these stories that are in the Bible that's connected to the stars like I had no idea mm -hmm. and I wanted to know that it's like okay these three streams that had been kind of living in me independent of one another came crashing together and mm -hmm. I was just thrilled mm -hmm. it wasn't just that I could find the mysteries of Christianity it was that the mysteries of history and historical events, like that you can read the script of things because it's written in the stars. And 
gosh, I, I feel like I'm jumping, but I should back up to my nine-year-old self. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. Go for it. I was given a, a book that had a perpetual calendar in the back. And I looked at it, and I turned to the page of my birth date, and it said there that the Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon had discovered Florida on my birthday. And I remember looking at that thinking, you mean you can know what happened every day in history? Like you can go through all of time? Mm. And what I would say now that my nine-year-old self realized is that a calendar with its neat black boxes and the way we organize time through a calendar, it's actually like a time machine because we can use it to plan and project into the future, but we can also use it to record and organize events out of the past. And we can do that from a present moment that's contained Mm -hmm. and held. Like we can say, like you and I have been discussing what time is it? What day is it? (laughs) This is, this is a function of the calendar. Yeah. And so I really woke up to the mystery of that when I was nine, which is half of the moon node. And then when I really had this epiphany listening to Hazel Straker was the astrosopher. She was from Wales um, in 1995. It was the same kind of moment. You mean all of these things can come together. Mm. And I think about that. And anthroposophy was like the container for it. I was like, wow, this is what it is. So I spent the entire next year reading a book by Willie Zucker called Cosmic Christianity and the Changing Countenance of Cosmology. Mm. So it's important to just mention who Willie Zucker is. Yes, he please. Was, I'm sorry. Yeah, so he, he – um, Elizabeth Breda was a doctor of math and astronomy. She was a colleague of Rudolf Steiner's, and he made her the head of the – astronomy mathematics section of the school for spiritual science and she singled out Willie Zucker as the person to develop astrosophy so this is new star wisdom of astrosophy and Hazel Straker whom I met was his partner once he moved to the United States a partner in research ah. so kind of like this direct Hazel Straker was connected to Willie Zucker who was given this task by Elizabeth Rada who was a colleague of Rudolf Steiner's right And so his book, Cosmic Christianity, I spent the whole next year after meeting Hazel Straker, I spent the whole year studying that book so I would really have a grasp. And then she came back to the community a year later because she used to come to the United States. She she passed away um, in the fall last year. Uh, It was in her 80s at least. But anyway, she, she would come occasionally through the United States. So she came back in 1996. And I went to the lecture, and she talked a bit of, about a very deep mystery um, in anthroposophy that has to do with the true nature of the second coming. Mm. And I, there was a profound lecture, and afterward, so there, there was this really mystical moment during the lecture where she paused, and she just looked up over everybody's head and just didn't say anything for a really long time. And it, it almost got awkward because it's like, what happened? Yeah. Did you just stop? Yeah, yeah. And, I almost get the impression like that she was having a, a clairvoyant perception of something, like waiting to see if something was living in the room strong enough so that she could share the mystery that she was about to share. Mm. So deep respect for the content and for her listeners. And so that then she did. She continued and finished her lecture. And then afterward, I approached her and I said, how do I become an astrosopher? And she asked me my name, and I said, it's Mary Adams, with an S at the end. And she just put her glasses down at the end of her nose, and she (laughs) looked me straight in the eye, and she chanted my name back to me three times, but without the S at the end. So she just looked straight at me and said, Mary, Adam, Mary, Adam, Mary, Adam. And then she just turned around and went about, you know, gathering up her things. And I was dumbfounded. I didn't know what to do. I just kind of froze. And yeah. I thought, well, you know, there's no, like, reading list. There's no something I need to go study. <laughs> there's no, like, yeah. it was really a call in freedom to be who I am and follow my destiny path. But it's not easy to do that because it's mm. like, well, what is it? Yeah. You know, I think in, in many spiritual practices, it's taught that 
self-knowledge is the hardest yeah. to find. And so this was really a call to the self and, and to be on a path through spiritual science that is informed by the stars according to how I could best figure it out. Mm. So she wasn't withholding information, but she also was keep making sure that I was kept free. So this is a theme that has operated in my life where as a child I was kept free and as a, you know, in my education I was kept free. And then here I was again, just kept free to, to carve out this path. So that triggered um, a really interesting dream about Rudolf Steiner. And later I figured out the other person in the dream was his wife, Marie Steiner, because at the time I knew nothing about the history of the anthroposophical movement. I didn't know that he was married. Yeah. Um, I didn't know any of that. And, and then I met uh, a woman that was a very strong karmic partner just within a week. So my name was chanted. I started re dreaming about Rudolf Steiner and his wife, and then I met this person who was really important in my destiny. Mm. And um, she found out that I knew how to read charts, and she was somebody that said, you know, you really ought to be doing this. But I wasn't doing it professionally. I was, I was just finding my way yeah. and not taking any kind of orthodox training. So I was pretty shy about it. It's like, well, no, this is just my own little thing that I'm doing to try to figure out my own life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Charging people, like getting money for what you're doing like that can yeah, be a bit or, awkward, or having, right? <laughs> or having people like listen to me as though I'm some kind of authority or that yeah, I yeah. got your of information. I was like, oh, I'm not ready for that. No, I was only, I think I was 32 at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So by that time, I knew that anthroposophy was my path. Mm. And then at that moment, I also knew that my path in anthroposophy was with the stars. Mm. Right, so I think that it's these mm. these gradual steps. Yeah, and I really thought that it meant that I should look up all of the astrosophers, and I had a really interesting series of experiences that is not a reflection on who they were, but really more on who I was. In that, I kept getting this sense very strongly within myself that the way astrosophy was being practiced and how it was being pursued by this the group that I was trying to connect with was not the way I was to do it yeah right and I couldn't understand that but I would have these dreams like there was one person in particular that I really respected and I loved his work and I had this dream where we were in a car together and he was driving and we went up a hill and got stuck in the mud and the car flipped over and we couldn't get out oh, <laughs> like okay this is not the way for you to go <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so um, I've probably mentioned my dreams several times already. I was born with a full moon in the 12th house, and one of the ways that that's interpreted is that the dream life is really strong and that a lot of mysteries are re revealed through the dream life. Ah. And that's true in my life. Yeah. So you can't always just wait on a dream to tell you what to do. But nonetheless, I've had, um, I've had that experience. So I listened and I paid attention. But what happened is that made me very shy about my work. And I really didn't want this group of people to see me and to see what I was doing. But at the same time, I needed to be, you know, I needed to be doing my work. Of course. Um, yeah. yeah. So in 1999, um, the node of the moon came back to the place where it was when Rudolf Steiner died. Mm. And it wasn't just that it came back to the place where it was when he died, but it came back to the place where it was when he died in 1925 at Michaelmas 1999. Wow. I thought that that was quite remarkable because I only knew about the feast of the Archangel Michael because of anthroposophy. Mm. And so much of Rudolf Steiner's message is about Michael and the Michaelic school and mm -hmm. understanding this being as the overseeing time spirit. And I just thought, you know, this is more than just a poetic coincidence that the last Michaelmas of the 20th century, when Rudolf Steiner was here doing his work, the node of the moon should be open in the same degree of the zodiac where it was when he crossed over the threshold. Like, that's a something. Yeah, for sure. And I ran, yeah, I ran into a friend at the, um, at the grocery store who was a member of the anthroposophical community, and I said, hey, you know, did you, did you, see, I, I'm with making the assumption that everybody knew all this stuff. He said, did you know that the note of the moon is, you know, in the same place it was when Rudolf Steiner died? And she looked at me and she said, Mary, 
I know you're telling me something really important, but I can't understand it. Nonetheless, will you come to our Michaelmas festival and share that? I said, yes, I'll come, I'll come. But yeah, then yeah. After, I thought, oh my gosh, what did I think I was doing? I've never given a lecture to this group of people before. What am I, I going to talk about? It? Oh, yeah. So the night before that talk, so this is Michaelmas 1999, I prayed really hard that I... I wouldn't mislead anyone because it had been such an intimate journey. It had just been me studying my life and my approach to the stars. I hadn't been really getting any direction from anybody. I wasn't connected with the professional astrosophers, and I didn't consider myself a professional astrologer. It's just me kind of going along, trying to figure it out. Now I'm going to give a lecture. Yeah. And so I prayed to not be misleading and that I didn't give misinformation. Okay, so now it's going to get a little bit esoteric. Good. The node, the node in the tropical zodiac at Michaelmas 1999 was at 11 degrees of Leo. I'm pretty sure that's where it was. So that's where it was when Rudolf Steiner died as well. Right. And then, um, so when I, I went to bed that night, and when I woke up in the morning, I... When I think about it in my my memory, in my mind's eye, it's as though a golden beam of light was streaming down beside my bed. And I was receiving a message. And the message was, after the betrayal, there were but 11. Over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. After the betrayal, there were but 11, 11, 11. Like, this is what 11 means. That it's a prerequisite to community building when the community has already been formed, but then there's been a betrayal. Oh, and so I didn't have that piece of this picture. I just saw the coincidence of the node with Rudolf Steiner's death and the Festival of Michaelmas in 1999. And now this third element was added to it. And so I actually went that day, gave the lecture, and talked about that. Mm. About the mystery of 11 and what that means and how when we come to an 11, um, this is what happens with the, the 11 apostles after Judas betrays the Christ being it's only 11 that go through the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then there's 40 days of teaching and then they experience the um, ascension. And then out of themselves, they have to find their way forward. And they spend this 10 days between ascension and Pentecost or Whitsunday, like struggling with what, what do we do? And Rudolf Steiner describes this as t the time of great despair for them. Because they're still thinking that they've got to find the Christ incarnate in a physical being outside of themselves. They haven't really awakened to it within themselves yet. Mm. And um, the moment they realize that it's between them, that they know what they're to do, and it's, this is described in the Acts of the Apostles, which I learned in high school, <laughs> um, but in chapter 2 where it says when they, they were all in one place of one accord. So that's an 11. That's one beside one. That's 11. Yeah. When that comes together and they recognize this higher divinity within one another, then there's an affirmation that comes from the spiritual world. You could even say from the celestial world that the rushing winds and the flaming tongues could be imagined as meteors that are like something is released from the celestial spiritual world that says to the human being, yes. And then this opens the capacity in them to speak the language of all people and to, to speak from the heart so that everyone can understand. And so this is a mystery that belongs to a community that forms out of one recognizing the other one. So this is what lives in 11. Mm. And so this was, you know, this was pretty early on. I can say that now. I mean, at the time I felt really sophisticated and like I'm getting, I was yeah. sophisticated in age, like that I was old enough. But um, so that kind of experience has been, I, I don't want to use the word constant because that presumes, for me, it feels like there's expectation in it. I don't always know that that is going to happen. Mm. But I have had a consistent experience that way where something kind of comes across a threshold to guide and direct, and I've worked to, to develop a trust in that. Mm. And um, so that was... That was a really important step in my journey to becoming somebody that speaks about the night sky, mm. to speak about it out of spiritual science. And then after um, two years later, I 
two or three years later, I moved to northern Michigan. So that was in Ann Arbor, which is four hours south of where I live now. And then I moved to northern Michigan to a non-anthroposophical community and needed to, I really felt very strongly, I needed to teach about the night sky, but now I need to figure out how to do it with a language that would be accessible to people who didn't know anthroposophy. Yeah. So how do I do that, you know, and stay true to it, stay true to my anthroposophy, so not water it down, not close the door, but at the same time, not make somebody who doesn't have access to it feel excluded. Mm. Um, so... I feel like I'm telling this story in a very disjointed way, so thank you for your patience. With oh me. no, it, it it all is flowing together quite well, actually, from my end. So continue. Okay, good. All yeah. right. So because I feel like it, it's important in my biography to share what what preceded my decision and what motivated my decision to move to Northern Michigan was that I then um, I ended up having four children and unfortunately was a single mother for once. My my youngest was six weeks old when their mm. dad moved to move to Chicago and then from that point on I was raising them by myself mm, go you hard work and yeah in, yeah in early 2000 the summer of 2001 I just really didn't feel well yeah and at the end of that summer I was reading um I'm still studying anthroposophy but kind of going at a slow pace because I had four children and they were small yeah <clears throat> you can only open yourself up so far when you when you've got that going on for sure you know, you've got a real keep an envi- a healthy environment around your kids and mm-hmm. so not that it's unhealthy but you know you can go too quickly through things yeah and so I was reading a lecture by Rudolf Steiner um, called wrong and right uses of esoteric knowledge and I remember it was the beginning of August I think it might have even been, been the feast of the transfiguration and in that letter he talks about some pretty interesting things with regard to technology that will be coming and the way human beings will be manipulated through economic oppression and this promise of the prolongation of life at the end of life and this mm. like artificial insemination. He doesn't quite use those words, but but looking at it from you know early twenty first century, it's like, wow, this is the stuff he was talking about. And he pretty much says, I don't even really need to explain it to you that much. Just think about what I'm saying and you'll see it. Yeah. So this is I mean, like, this is the spiritual initiate saying this thing is so close to us that you can see it. it doesn't take supernatural powers. But there was some information in that lecture that was really, um, had a really deep effect on me. And actually, the way I have often described it is that it shattered something in me, mm. which um, I've since come to understand is an experience that you have on a spiritual path where at a certain point of coming to self-knowledge, not that I've achieved it, but there's something that's called breaking the inner mirror. So that when we do try to understand our own true nature within the self, that we have to get past that mirror that is just a reflection of the self. Yeah, right. It, 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 it's got a crack. And this is something that Alfred Lord Tennyson, his poem, um, The Lady of Shalott, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's this critical moment where... The whole premise of the poem is that she's never allowed to look out her window and see the world directly. She can only look in the mirror. But then she sees the plume of Lancelot, and this inspires her to look. And as soon as she looks, the mirror cracks. And then she says, you know, the curses come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. You know, so this is, Tennyson has couched this deeply spiritual experience in this poem. Um, so, but nonetheless, I, I had this experience. I didn't didn't know at the time that that was going on, but I felt this kind of inner shattering. And within a couple of weeks, I contracted meningitis, and I, I almost died. Wow. And it was um, a really profound experience of having a precognitive dream about events that were coming and then having to make a decision about whether or not I was going to stay in life and go through it. So the dream, um, it, this feels very deeply personal, but I'm, I'm going to share it with you, that the, the dream was that I was taken to, my dad wanted to introduce me to some individuals that we went to this really tall building with glass around, and they came in, and they were all wearing turbans, so that it was like trying to identify the ethnicity, and when they came in, I thought, wow, this is going to get really dangerous, and I'm not sure I want to be here, and I woke up 
Now, this was exactly 18 days before the events of November, uh, excuse me, September 11th in 2001. Mm. And I know that there are a lot of people, at least in the United States, that have since described that they were having kind of this precognitive or forethought about this event. And I think the way that works is that when there is a community of people doing a particular kind of work together, that um, it's as though it, it lives in the spiritual world. And I think a decision was made at a certain point among those who crafted this event. Mm. And I think I dreamed into that space. Yeah, right. right. Like, like wow. there's a thought form and I, I dreamed into it. Yeah, that's I can all. say that. Yeah. And because of the nature of it, without my being really fully consciously aware of that, I, it really, I was in a kind of a, a vulnerable state because I had shattered the inner mirror yeah. and I was not feeling well. My health was threatened and I was just kind of open. So it was a real fight for my life for uh, about a week. I was hospitalized and um, had these pretty dramatic experiences and then spent the next almost two years kind of recovering. Mm. So that what preceded my moving to northern Michigan and also made it very clear to me that certain certain parts of my life had become limited because of that the nature of that kind of an illness and I needed to really focus on what I was doing. Now of course I'm still a single mom. I still had four kids. They were still young. But I knew very strongly that I needed to be teaching about the night sky and I needed to do it no matter how, no matter where, no matter when. It was what I had to do. Mm. And so um, pursuing that, continuing on that path, led me to meeting. um, I met a a journalist who then started writing about my work. That I I said, well, I tell stories of the night sky. And he said, what do you mean? I I said, about the stars. He said, like Hollywood? I said, no, like the stars (laughs) in the sky. (laughs) And then he introduced me to a woman that had started started a, an organization that was trying to protect the night sky from light pollution, and she's the one that told me about the International Dark Sky Association. And then through um, through the two of them, I found uh, I was introduced to the county where I live. They have a park. It was dark there, so I went to the county and said, you know, we could get this protected by the International Dark Sky Association, and people will be coming to learn about the night sky. And they really laughed at me. They're like, are you kidding? I said, but listen, believe me, people will travel from around the world to learn about the night sky. And so it took two years and we got the designation and we were only the sixth in the United States and ninth in the world at the time. And people started coming from around the world. And so the county commissioners here, they were looking at me like, how did you do that? And I said, it wasn't me. People just want to connect to the stars I happen to know that. That's all. I just, I just had knowledge that you didn't have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I spent the next ten years um, working as an independent contractor with the county, teaching about the night sky as an anthroposophist, but also very aware that my audience was not populated by anthroposophists. So, how could I open a door for someone who might not be thinking about the stars through the humanities, um, or might not? recognize that you don't have to have a telescope to know something about the night sky because not only was I having the experience that light pollution is prohibiting people from experiencing the stars, it's our own types of education and our own thinking about the sky that when it's only informed by the science of astronomy, um, there's oftentimes in astronomy the description of the sky is very violent. You know, stars explode in supernova, then there's black holes that devour things, and there might be a random asteroid that's going to strike us, and we're going to have another planetary extinction. And I mean, it's really yeah, big stuff that I thought, you know what, some of the highest achievements in human history have resulted from human beings trying to understand their relationship to the stars, the pyramids, the cathedrals, literature, poetry, art. I mean, really high, really healing really inspiring work so it's Mm -hmm. not just all violence and dread and we need to be afraid of the randomness it's it's harmony and there's rhythm and I really like kind of appointed myself this task of being a voice for that Mm. so my my mission statement then became for for me because I felt like okay I need to have a mission statement so that if somebody asks me I can tell them so my mission statement is um 
safeguarding the human imagination by protecting our access to the night sky and its stories. Mm. So even though I was leading a dark sky park, I would oftentimes say to people, you know, it really isn't about the sky. It's about the human imagination. Now, we need the stars to cultivate that imagination, but really it's about putting the human being back at the center of our thinking about this relationship, not physically, because we know that the earth is not at the, phys at the physical center, but centering our own thought on the human being in relationship. That's the right perspective, because we are the ones that generate the thought about the celestial world. So while we have figured out that there are black holes and that there are um, you know, long period comets that maybe only pass through our system once and just all of the magnificent things that astronomers have figured out, it's our thought projected out into space. And if we don't recognize that we stand at the center of that thought, then we're making a misstep at the very first step. So mm -hmm. I'm always trying to put the human being back at the center. Say from here, from from this human being on the earth, then I go out into my experience and I can build a, a ladder to the stars through fairy tales or I can do it through Renaissance art or I can do it through math. I can use a telescope. I can. There's just any number of ways to access the night sky. Um, so that's, it's out of that then that I started to say, okay, I am a star lore historian. Mm. I use astrology. I use astronomy, I use astrosophy, because these are the things that came on my path. And I'm just trying to be a human being about it. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> wow. That, I think, is essentially, um, we've just heard part one of the podcast about your journey yeah. through to becoming a star lore historian. And so that's yeah. how the Storyteller's Night Sky began. Yes. Yeah, How start wonderful. out of that. Gosh, thank you for sharing all those stories. That was so interesting. I just yeah. I felt like I was yeah. just listening to a story just now. It was very pleasant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of it might strike as odd or as, oh, who does she think she is? But it's also, um, it's a very intimate path. We think about the stars as being really far away from us and that, you know, even in astronomy, it's described that the light that we see from a star was emitted so long ago that the star might not even be there anymore, mm. which is, I think, really a sad thought. Yeah. So what's important to me is to say, you know, I am having an intimate experience of something in this present moment. And it needs to, and, and I, I look for an affirmation of being human, not mm. a denial of being human. Mm. Right. So I'm very sensitive to that like oh that thought doesn't strike me as something that I can live into fully as yeah. a human being yeah and I don't want really to say that it's a thought in error but that there might be something in addition that's happening and when you look at the the muses as described in ancient Greek mythology uh, Urania is the muse of astronomy and all of the muses are the daughters of uh, Nemesine she's the goddess of memory Mm. And so it, I think it's really beautiful that the muses are the daughters of memory. Astronomy is one of the muses. So astronomy is a daughter of memory, but she alone among all of the muses is the only one that has the gift of prophecy. Ah. So even I though like she's that. a daughter of memory, she can see the future. Mm. And so I think that this is an important thing to bear in mind. And I think of it every time somebody says, well, the light left that star so long ago that it's not even that. It's like, well, that's a memory, but it's also we can see the future in the light of that star. Yeah. And so um, when we get beyond the, the time space elements in the physical world, the laws change. And even though we can project our physical laws out into that world, they're not necessarily correct in assessing what that world is about. And that's, I think, where spiritual science comes in. Mm, totally. Yeah. How wonderful. So, shall we dive into actually um, talking about astrosophy, astrology, and astronomy? Yeah, let's do that. Oh, thank you. Um, are, yeah, you, are you going okay, Mary, by the way? Do you, are you I'm doing good, okay I'm for good. time? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I, yeah, time is fine. Okay, good. Um, 
there's a beautiful comet that's visible for us in the northern hemisphere right now, but it's not going to show up for another three hours. So <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah. Okay. So you've got that you don't have to me for three hours, but I'm not in a hurry yet. Yeah, that's good to know. Good to know. Yeah. So um, there's a beautiful verse that Rudolf Steiner gave to Marie Steiner in December of 1922. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me see. No, I take that back. 1921. It was, it was the Christmas, just just a few days later, the first Cartianum burned down. Yeah, so 22 to 23. Right. So it was 1922. And this verse is pretty well known in the anthroposophical community. I'll just say it quickly. Please, please. Um, it is, the stars spoke once to human beings. It is world destiny that they are silent now. To be aware of this silence can be pain for earthly humanity. But in this deepening silence, there grows and there ripens what human beings speak to the stars. To be aware of this speaking can become strength for spirit man. And so spirit man is an actual um, description of kind of the highest nature that the, of, that the human being is able to reach to in this particular space and time. Mm. But this verse... Um, I lived with it for a long time, and then what it started to reveal to me is that I think what Rudolf Steiner was doing was showing these these three steps in an evolution of star knowledge, where the stars speaking to humanity, star speaking literally is the star word or the astro logos. Mm -hmm. So the first part of this verse refers to the period of time when the astrologos or the astrology developed. And that has to do with the Egypto-Chaldean period of time that is, you know, at 4000 BC and, and prior to that time, which in Anthroposophy is described as the third post-Atlantean epoch. So this is when the star wisdom that is described as astrology, that's when that really begins to develop. But then... That's what uh, dominates the consciousness of humanity that is influenced by that Egypto-Chaldean culture for thousands of years until we get to the time of Nicholas Copernicus and the scientific revolution in the 1500s. And now Nicholas Copernicus introduces the idea. Well, he wasn't really the one that originated the idea, but he wrote it down in such a way that um, there was no real way for spiritual consciousness to penetrate the way he was describing the fact that the earth through his calculation, the earth is actually orbiting the sun mm. like the other planets. So the word planet means wandering star. And prior to this idea being introduced kind of into the mainstream, the earth wasn't considered a planet because a planet was wandering around among the stars and the earth mm. was considered at the center. And so when this idea is introduced that the Earth is like the wandering stars, it's a planet that's orbiting the sun, this is the world destiny moment when the speaking of the stars goes silent. So stars spoke once to human beings. It is world destiny that they are silent now. Yeah. So the first part of the verse is about the astrology or the astrologos. The second part refers to this world destiny moment where we have then the beginning of the science of astronomy or the, or the astronomia. So the body of knowledge that develops around the stars and around the planetary spheres, or not even the spheres, but the planetary bodies themselves, that have to do with things like how far away is it? What's the periodicity of its orbit? What's the chemical composition of its atmosphere? How long does it take the light to travel from there to here? So things that can be defined by uh, physical laws. And so in this uh, couching of the star knowledge in the physical laws, there's a loss of the speaking of the divine beings that give ex that, that are expressing themselves through the movement of the planets in, the, in relationship to the stars. Mm -hmm. So the astrologos kind of doesn't really fulfill, but it goes quiet, and then the astronomia develops. And this is of necessity because human beings can no longer, at this point in the stage of consciousness where they are, can no longer take an a external dictate for determining where they're going. Like we be, need to become self-authorizing and we need to develop capacities of will that can be um, informed by our own sense of self, not from an external thing, not from the influence of a star or even the influence of a church and something outside of me 
we need to become self-directing. Mm. So this is what's kind of happening there at the beginning of the scientific revolution. And then we get to the beginning of the 20th century and Rudolf Steiner giving this verse and the end of the verse where he says, now the human being is becoming aware that they've lost this star knowledge and this and the capacity to hear the speaking of the stars. And now what must happen is that the human being has to recognize that the human being is speaking. Mm. And so this is the astrosophia. And really, to say it correctly, you would have to say it's the anthropo-astrosophia, because it's the speaking of the human being to the stars. So mm. astrosophy is not just an updated virgin, version of astrology, no. because something has shifted tremendously in the consciousness of humanity, and at the third post-Atlantean epoch during the Egypto-Chaldean period, star wisdom is descending toward the human being. It's coming toward the human being, and you could say through the mystery of Golgotha, this, this mighty being enters all the way into the stream of earthly humanity, and you could say the star that shines over the birth of the Christ child is a, a pictorial representation of a star coming to the earth. Mm. and the earth then embarking on its journey of becoming a star. And so now that that has entered the stream of earthly evolution right through the human being, now the human being must speak from that star within the self back into the spiritual world. So astrosophy in, my, in this picture, then you, so it's the astrologos, the astronomia, and the astrosophia is the kind of, threefold call of the stars that's expressed in that verse by Rudolf Steiner. So the star speaking is the astrologos, the, the world destiny moment of them going silent is the astronomia, and then to become aware that we are speaking that can be strength for spirit man, that's the astrosophia. Wow. Amazing. Wow. So yeah. did you, did you, um, is that an idea that came to you? Have you heard anyone else speak like that? Um, yeah, no, that's, um, I don't know if anybody else speaks about it that way, but that is how it came to me out of living with that verse. Wow. And what was remarkable about it was that I, I used to have the thought that astrology emerged from astronomy, mm. but it's actually the opposite. Astrology, yeah. not the way we know astrology now, but the astrologos and the capacity to hear the speaking of the stars, that was the first thing. Then the astronomy. Right. And so it was it was that thought that then thinking about that and looking at that verse, that's what made it wake up in me. Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. I see what this is. This yeah. is astrologos, this is astronomy, and then then this is the astrosophy. We speak to the stars. Yeah, wow. So we Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm just, you've referred to it as astrosophia as well. Would you, is that, is there a difference between astrosophy and astrosophia? Like, or is it just an interchangeable word for you? Well, I mean, I read it the same way, but when you say it that way, just like you could say astrology, and I'm saying the astro logos, so that you get oh, the yeah. this is coming from. I see. I see the being, the logos, mm. and the nomia, and the sophia, these are beings. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm. Good yeah, stuff. so the way I began to learn um, astrosophy, you know, I, I don't necessarily feel qualified to be the person to say, here's what this is in a broad context. I can tell you what it is to me. That's good. Right? Yeah. And on my back. And so <clears throat> what I learned in my study is that what an astrosopher will do in looking at a chart, it's not necessarily just the moment of birth. It's, and it's not just the moment of conception. Mm. It's the moment that's described as the descent of the spirit germ. So this comes out of an ancient understanding that every human being comes from a star. Not just you have a sign of the zodiac that governs your birth, but that there's a particular star where, as a soul spirit being, you live in the time between death and rebirth. And there will be a moment in when you are in the vicinity of that star where a decision is made to take up earthly incarnation. And this is referred to as the midnight of the soul. Mm. And from that moment, what happens then, I'm going to really abbreviate this, but what happens is that 
It's like the beginning of a journey through the starry realm, through the planetary spheres, until you come to close to the Earth sphere where we're kind of hanging out in the moon sphere <laughs> until the right moment of the birth is going to happen. But the way this was articulated by the ancients is that as we come from our star through the starry regions, we pick up the gifts from the hierarchical beings to form the physical body. And then as we move through the planetary spheres, we pick up the harmonious rhythm of the inner organism of the human being. And so you'll see even well into the Middle Ages charts that show the relationship of the human body in its form to the constellations of the zodiac and to the inner organism and the inner organs to the planets. And this is where this idea comes from. So Aries mm -hmm. is the head and Taurus is the larynx and Gemini is the limbs and all the way down to Pisces, the feet. So when you look at the constellations in the night sky, if you wonder, like, that constellation doesn't look like what they call it. It's not because the ancients were not saying, we're going to call it this because we're going to call it a ram because it looks like a ram. No, Aries doesn't look like a ram, but a ram is an animal that uses its head. And from Aries, we receive the forces for forming the human head. So mm. the, the code word in the mystery school, if you're, you know, you can't reveal the mystery, but if you're going to speak about this, then you speak about the ram. Yeah, and if yeah. somebody has been initiated, then they know. Oh, we're speaking about the forces of Aries where we receive the forces for the human head. Mm. Right. So this is, um, so this was the mystery wisdom. And then, then the planetary spheres as you're moving through, um, I think Saturn is spleen, Jupiter is liver, Mars is gallbladder. So as we're moving through the planetary spheres, then we're getting, we're picking up the rhythm. So, and then, then the soul spirit being comes to the moon sphere. It's kind of a crude way to say it, but, and it, you kind of like have this spirit germ that will then be the seed uh. that needs to drop into the earthly sphere. Yeah. Literally into the womb of the mother. Once the conception has taken place, you could say, um, the intercourse and the conception opens the space in the physical world for the spirit germ then to, to slip in. Yeah, right. And that descent of the spirit germ happens on the 18th day. On the 18th day? After conception. Right, oh, so at, right, that, I see. That, at that moment, the phase of the moon at that moment will be the same phase of the moon when the child is then born nine months later. Oh, so that's how you can work out... That's how you yes. can work out. Ah, oh, okay. Wow. So you go from moon to moon. So, for instance, I was born at full moon, which means at that 18th day, the full the moon would have been full. And then you can go month by month through the gestation. For, for me, it would have been from full moon to full moon. The first full moon cycle is the first seven years of the life. And then the second seven-year cycle will be from 7 to 14. The third seven-year cycle will be 14 to 21. And then what you can do is you read the planetary aspects that are taking place each month and you can project it then into the age that the individual will be when that particular aspect took place because it's like informing the body as it's developing in the womb of the mother. Mm. So for instance, if Saturn conjuncted the sun during the first month of your pregnancy, you can calculate right to the day that that will be realized somewhere in the first seven years of the life of the child. That it will happen again, you mean? That it, that, that, that aspect that happened as the, as the, the fetus was forming yeah. and informed, that will play out in the, like, the destiny and the individual oh. that is being born, and I... you can see the date that that will happen. Oh, interesting. Do you do, do, you, do you read, you obviously read charts for people? I can, I have the program and I can do that. I don't, I look at it in my own life. Um, I feel like that's deeply sacred work. Mm. And I, I don't feel like I could, I can, can professionally do that for someone. Mm. Um, I, I need to, I need, me personally, I need more information. Yeah, right. Yeah. I really want to keep someone free and it's hard in doing astrology charts and doing this, you know, it's just, you can point to a date. Mm. There's this beautiful poem by Emily Dickinson. Um, it's go thy great way. The, st uh, the stars thou meetest. No, 
boxes. Yeah. Go thy great way. The stars thou meetest are even as thyself. For what are stars but asterisks to point a human life? Mm. And so mm. when you're reading stars, what you can do is you can find a date and a time and you can tell a person when to pay attention. And you can even maybe give nuance about what might be the nature of the experience. But the main thing is that it allows you to say, on this date, on that time, something is going to be aspected. So just pay attention. Mm. You know, so it shows you, the stars show you where to look. And also, they show you, looking back, you can see planetary aspects and you can go, oh, well, that happened on that date. So I can look into my life and see what took place and start to figure out, is that connected to that planetary aspect? So it's really a guidance for, um, it's like a signpost that says, pay attention right here. You might otherwise speed right by it and not know that something significant took place here. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. the stars allow us to look at that. Mm. Um, so in the work of astrosophy, I know that Hazel Straker, it was very important for her to work with birth charts and, and prenatal epoch and that kind of a chart, particularly with individuals that um, didn't fully incarnate and so might be described as having a certain kind of a disability or a handicap mm. and to look at where where might it be in the star picture that you could find that to so then to work with the, the soul spirit being at that level and that's very deep and sacred work um, and I you know, I totally bow down to that <laughs> it's yeah. amazing what a gift <clears throat> to be able to do that for one's fellow human beings. Mm -hmm. That I cannot do. Yeah. I know about it. Yeah. I know about it. Interesting. Yeah, so then, um, and also, this lends itself to talking about the difference between the tropical and the sidereal zodiac, because most of the astrosophers that I know will only use the sidereal zodiac. And the word sidereal means in relationship to the stars. Whereas the tropical zodiac is rooted in a fixed division of the 360 degrees of the zodiac based when you put the zero point at spring equinox on March 21st. Right. And that's a fixed moment in calculating the tropical zodiac, but that moment shifts over time. So the tropical zodiac isn't an actual picture of where things are, even physically, um, but it, it is connected to us uh, in the physical realm in a different way than the sidereal zodiac, and I think it, they have to do with the different different bodies. You and I were talking about this uh, messaging, and sometimes it's really easy to describe it, and other times it's a little bit more elusive. Um, yeah. But in the original, yeah, in the original calendar of the soul that Rudolf Steiner published in 1912. He used both. He used the he had new images of the zodiac for the sun and the dates on the pages where those images were included were according to the sidereal zodiac. And then he also had new images of the zodiac for the moon, and those dates were according to the tropical zodiac. So for a lot long time I have had the imagination that the tropical zodiac belongs to our experience when we're in the day wake world in what Aristotle referred to as the sublunary world. Like we're uh, on the earth, we're beneath the orbit of the moon. Yeah. And this is where, you know, time moves in a linear fashion. Things have a beginning, a middle, and end. There's birth and there's death. This is what happens in this physical sphere. And then when you move beyond the moon sphere, it's it shifts. And now you think about things relative to the stars. So I really have this sense that the tropical zodiac is for this sublunary work and then if we're wanting to move beyond the sublunary then you are stepping into the sidereal zodiac and looking at things relative to the stars it also you know you could say the tropical has to do with the formative body the etheric and the sidereal because it's it means to, to the stars it has to do with the astral or star body mm. so um, just to ask a kind of basic question, would you, according to everybody's sun signs, which seem to be the most well known, yes. do you, in your opinion, knowing that this isn't for all 
astrosophers. Would you um, assume that people are what they think they are, or do you, has the date shifted? So am I a Taurus in Europe? My birthday is the 14th of June, so I've always assumed I'm a Gemini. But am I? You are. You are. Yeah, according to... So I, I can say what Hazel Straker said to me when I asked her. I yeah. said, which zodiac is correct? And she said, they all are. And this was another response that left me in total freedom to find my way. And so I feel that eliminating one or the other is not the right thing to do. You have to start somewhere. So start with what you know yeah. and then allow yourself to grow and then reassess. And when it comes time for you to say, okay, I'm no longer a Gemini, then you will know. But like I'm Aries in the tropical zodiac, but Pisces in the sidereal, I have to totally shift either my concept about what Pisces is or my concept about who I am to get to that thought. It's like, whoa, yeah. I don't resonate with that at all. But I try to trying to think of it as, okay, this is another level of my own being that I'm trying to awaken to. Yeah. Now, in my awake consciousness, when I'm moving through my day-to-day, I'm very much Aries, you know? <laughs> That's my vibe. Yeah. But in that more quiet, meditative, contemplative, maybe I could even call it spiritual nature, am I more Piscean? Is it that? Mm. You know, so think about it that way. Um, because it isn't just a matter of saying, well, I'm going to take an interpretation of Pisces in the tropical zodiac and just say now I'm Pisces because that's what I am in a sidereal they, they don't interpret the same way mm. They're two different things and so that's what makes it kind of tricky it's interesting too because when you put two when the star signs are in order it's almost like the one next to it is the opposite I mean if you've got a, a you know you've got an Aries and a Pisces that's a water and a and a fire sign fire. and that's then you've got Taurus and a Gemini that's earth and air and I do, yeah. I mean, I do know that in my own self, I need to find ways to ground and be more still and be more Taurian. <laughs> so it's quite, and I've always known that before I learned all of this, and it just was quite interesting to live with that picture of being like, oh, maybe I'm being offered a chance to, well, not a chance, but maybe I'm offer, offered a way to look at myself to grow these capacities that I know that I actually need. Yeah, you know, and it's it's beautiful. I mean, because this is what the stars do. They affirm us. Mm. We know something about yourself, and then you think, oh, look, th- look, there that is. It wasn't just me. Yeah. There's something outside of me that is saying yes to me in that way. And also, I mean, ultimately, we can become all of it, right? So we, we don't have to self-define according to this one moment. Yeah. But I, I think it's important for us, when you look at the evolution of human consciousness, the idea that the earth is fixed at the center is something that allows us to develop consciousness, right? So we live, you know, in the foundation stone meditation, human soul, you live within the resting head. In order for us to think, we can't be like flailing the head around. You have to still the head. <laughs> So that the thought can happen, it can develop. So if you projected that into like the, the history of human consciousness, you can see that there's a moment where in the history of our becoming aware, we have to fix the earth in place so that yeah. we can think about it. Mm. And then once we have developed a certain level of maturity in our relationship to the earth, then we can begin to move it and yeah. not lose it. Right, mm-hmm. because if it moves too soon before we're ready, then we might be, oh, I'm not ready for that motion. <laughs> yeah. And so it's the same thing with the individual. Like you can say, okay, I'm, I'm Gemini, and I fix right there because that allows me to think. Mm. And if I go to Taurus too soon, I might lose the ground. Mm. Um, so it's being very self-aware, and it maybe not even Taurus. You might go to a different Earth sign. You could reach over to Virgo, or go to Capricorn. You know, just just yeah. to tease out the idea Mm. Um, because we all have all of it within us but the where the planet planetary bodies are in the chart draws attention and emphasis Um, yeah right and you could say like there's a i have this wonderful picture it's a 
it's kind of a souvenir from Egypt, but it's a painting on a papyrus, mm-hmm. not an ancient papyrus, but, you know, a century papyrus of the star, the sky goddess Nut, and she's arched over um, the earth, and at the end of every day, she swallows the sun, and then it moves through her body, and then at dawn, each morning, she gives birth to yeah. the sun. Yeah. And beneath her, there are two or three rows of human beings doing activity uh, on the um, horizontal plane. And then underneath that, there are these vertical columns in which you see all of these Egyptian hieroglyphs. And I have this imagination that because the Egyptians believed very strongly in an afterlife, that each one of those columns could be imagined as a degree of the zodiac. Mm -hmm. Um, that we come again and again and kind of like we get a, a little plot in a garden and we cultivate the garden. And so maybe this time around you're doing the tomatoes and I'm over here doing the cabbages. <laughs> and last time I did potatoes and next time I'm going to do cucumbers. Like I'm not going to do the whole garden every time. I'm going to do one corner of it mm-hmm. at a time. Mm-hmm. And that it's possible in the image of nut arcing over the earth that each one of those columns wherever there's a hieroglyph, is an indication of what was achieved in a particular incarnation mm. at that degree of the zodiac. So then we, we were born, the planets occupy a certain position that draws attention to maybe here's something that you need to develop or here's a gift that you brought back with you. Here's something that belongs to your destiny path that is this garden that you've been cultivating time after time after time. Mm. You know, so it's a really beautiful picture that allows you to be free from feeling like you have to do it all, but also frees you from thinking, I'm only this one thing. Yeah. It's such a big, um, well, in your life, hearing your story, how freedom is such an important, uh, has been such an important theme. It is, I think, for all of us, but for you, it's it's very standout-ish. Especially because I think um, as people who are really into astrology and can get really fixated in where they are and who they were were at the moment of birth, so to speak. And it's just, again, just using our star signs as an example. It's like you're an Aries, you've always been an Aries, and that's just how you behave when you are met with certain situations. That's just, that's just you. And we forget yeah. that, like you say, we actually are all, and we have the freedom to choose. Nothing, they say you know, our destiny is written in the stars, but we're also, it's a really, um, we can be really, we have to be careful with things like astrology or divination tools that they don't tie us into limiting our freedom. Right. You know, because right. again, yeah. like I say, people yeah. kind of just get really fixated on these little boxes they put themselves in. And even though they're all open-minded and spiritual, they still will put themselves in a box Yes. <laughs> you know? And sometimes the box serves. It's like, okay, I'm going to be fixed right here for a while, and maybe it's going to take me 20 years. Maybe yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I don't get scattered. But also, Rudolf Steiner says this really interesting thing about prophecy. Mm. And he said it's not even whether prophecy is accurate or whether it's true. What's important about it is that it engages the will toward the future. Oh, I love right, that. Right, so like prognosticating through astrology isn't wrong. It isn't bad. It can engage the will toward the future, but we have to have a certain level of maturity in it because of what you just described. If if I say to you, all right, Amanda, you've got Jupiter doing X, Y, Z, and I'm telling you that, and Jupiter is standing behind me in my speaking of that, that's going to sit with you in a much stronger way than if somebody says, oh, i got a feeling that maybe this is going to happen. You know, it doesn't have as much weight. And so the star person, the astrologer, the astronomer, the astrosera, has to be really, really mindful mm. that there's a speaking and a language there that can have an influence. And my... Because of my experience, I'm really interested in trying to keep the other free. How do I share this information yet keep you free? Mm. How do we do that for one another? Um, and then maybe I, you know, I don't know if I achieve it. I try. Um, and I think it had a lot to do with why in my destiny path, I came to a community where there were no anthroposophists, so I couldn't rely on a shared language or a shared ideology. 
I had to develop a way to speak about the stars to like the lay person in a way that didn't cut them off from the potential for recognizing the spiritual nature. Mm. And it was quite a task yeah. and I really enjoyed it, but it wasn't, it wasn't always easy to, to figure out like, how do I, how do I, how do I do this and honor what I strive to understand? Mm. Um, you know, sometimes you go too far for a person. Like you leave the door open way too wide. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I think we have to give ourselves the encouragement to say, yeah, it's okay for me to define this way right now. And so long as I recognize that there's going to come a time when I might feel differently. Mm -hmm. And I give myself permission at that point as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I wonder if we could talk, got to go a little bit more specific into some aspects of uh, uh, astrology, astronomy, yes. star wisdom, star law. Um, yes. <laughs> you, you were, um, a lot of people have been talking about the, the conjunction between Jupiter, Jupiter and Saturn, which you mentioned. Um, yes. Would you be able to describe why it's such a big deal and perhaps relate it to that Saul at the Gates of Damascus story? Ah, yes, yes, I can tell you that. Um, so when you look into the night sky without a telescope, as ancient human beings did and through the Middle Ages up until the 1600s, and you're charting the rhythms of things, the furthest planet away from us that we can see is actually also the one that is moving the slowest. Right. And so that one was always related to time and marking the boundary of time. And that's the planet we know as Saturn, who for the ancient Greeks was named Kronos. Mm -hmm. so this is time. And then there's another one out there moving more than twice as fast, much brighter. Uh, and this planet is associated with the, not the past, but with the future and with creating space and movement and that's Jupiter. Ah. So we have, you could say, and Jupiter Jupiter always wants to be growing things. It's the largest of the planets. And so I think there's this really wonderful, just this amazing cosmic wisdom in the fact that Jupiter is wanting to grow, but beyond its orbit, there's Saturn containing everything within the boundary of time mm. so that Jupiter doesn't just grow endlessly, right? Yeah. So, so Jupiter in its 12-year rhythm, is kind of connected to space, things that happen in space. And Saturn, with its 28-year rhythm, is connected to things that happen in time. Right. So together they are, uh, you could say, Saturn is the time king and Jupiter is the master of space. Mm, and cool. because of the difference in their orbits, they only come together once every 20 years. But it's predictable. Mm. And... This has been known for centuries. This is not a new thing that only belongs to contemporary astronomy, but probably one of the most famous incidents of somebody studying the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter was Johannes Kepler in the 1600s. And he was able to calculate back and for him figure out that it might very well have been a great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter and between 5 and 7 BC that was the sign that the wise men of the east saw in the heavens that said to them a significant birth is about to take place. Right. So Johannes Kepler said it was the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. So the, through the, what Willie Zucker did in his work was to look at the life of the Christ being from the baptism in the river Jordan to the crucifixion and look at what the planetary gestures were during that three and one third years and then project those aspects through time to see when and where in history do they repeat and so he would say okay there was this aspect happening here at this time in this region of the zodiac and when that repeats you can look for something that might be connected with that and the way hazel straker described it to me was that that three and one third years of the Christ walking on the earth was as though a time when a mighty uh, celestial lyre was crafted around the earth, right? So this beautiful stringed instrument. And that every time 
one of the aspects recurs that happened during that time. It's as though a note is sounded out on that cosmic lyre, and mm. it's up to us to hear it. Right. So it's not going to be an exact repetition of what occurred then, but something that lived in that very high mystery is sounding at such a time. Mm. And so, so when I met her, she was speaking about the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter because it was going to happen in May of 2000 in the same region of the Zodiac where it had 2,000 years earlier when Saul as a very high initiate in his uh, tribal wisdom was on his way to Damascus to persecute the early Christians because it was his experience that they were in error thinking that Jesus of Nazareth had incarnated the Christ being. Mm -hmm. So his intent was to, to, I think it was just to kill them, yeah, right. to send them across the threshold. They could see that this was not the reality. And as he is on his way, Christ being spoke to him out of the spiritual world, and because of his level of initiation, he knew that this being could only speak to him if he had already incarnated physically. Ah. So he had this, this moment of recognition. The Christ being is speaking to him from the spiritual world, and at that moment he realizes he was the one that was in error. So he's struck, you know, he can't speak, he's blind, he's just for, for three days, and then the Christ appears to Ananias and says, there is one, you know, a man that is needs your help, you need to take him into your home, and Ananias says, you know, but with all due respect, he's one of our <laughs> enemies, yeah. and the Christ says, but he is a vessel chosen unto me. So this is a really beautiful moment where both Saul of the uh, uh, of Tarsus, he's Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus, and Ananias, they're completely opposed to one another, and both of them have to make a complete turn mm. in order to meet out of the Christ impulse to bring healing. So Ananias takes Saul into his home, places his hands on him, he is able to restore to sight, and then he becomes Paul, who is the great, you know, great teacher of Christianity, particularly for the Gentiles, is how he's described. Mm -hmm. And so that's the conjunction that's happening this year is not in the same degree of the Zodiac, but that was happening in May of 2000. And the one that's occurring now is not necessarily one that is close to the time of the incarnation of the Christ, but it seems to have about it the mood of annunciation. Mm -hmm. And when you look at all of the events that have already been happening in the year 2020, but also at the celestial gestures in 2020, you can see that something is trying to break through in the consciousness of humanity. Mm. With the planets, with the lineup of the planets, the great conjunction, Venus completing its eight-year rhythm. I mean, there's just a lot sounding out right now. Yeah. And, and you see it stirring in the, in the global economy in the life of rights, in the national societies, and then right down to the level of the, the individual freedoms in the cultural sphere. So you've got mm -hmm. kind of this threefold thing going on in the economy, in the rights sphere, and in the cultural sphere around the world. Yeah. Um, and we haven't had this before, where it's happening globally. So it's as though something is announcing itself. And when Saturn and Jupiter come together, at winter solstice, so the sun will be at its place furthest below the celestial equator, so you'll be having your summer down there, up here in the north, will be at winter solstice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's standing still, so that there's that deep in-breath and pause, and then these two will come together. Right. Now, they'll be together, um, you know, on either side of that date, but that's the date when, when they're the closest. Mm -hmm. And what what's interesting is that Every time they, they, it takes 20 years for these two planets to come together. And every 20 years when they meet, they're another third of the way through the zodiac. So that after 60 years, the conjunction comes back to the place where it was 60 years earlier. Uh, it has moved a few degrees, but what happens is, say for instance, the great conjunction happens in Gemini. 20 years later, it's going to happen in the next air sign, Libra. 20 years after that, it's going to happen in the next air sign, Aquarius. Then 20 years later, it's back in Gemini. So it will happen in the same element 
of the zodiac, oh. and because of the way it moves through, it takes about 200 years for it to go through each element. So for 200 years, you'll have conjunctions in the air signs, and then the next 200 years, the conjunctions will happen in the water signs. Then the next 200 years, they'll be happening in the fire signs, and then the next 200 years, they'll be in the, I don't know if I did it in order, in the earth signs. <laughs> Then you're back to air again, mm. but now, now 800 years have passed. Mm. So the conjunction that's coming in, the, in uh, December in the tropical zodiac is happening at zero degrees of Aquarius, which is an air sign, and it's the beginning of the air sign conjunctions for the first time since 800 years ago, ah. which puts us back in the 1200s, which is when... Francis of Assisi, he died the year of a great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. Hmm. Um, Dante was born during the year of a great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. He wrote about it in his Divine Comedy. I mean, so you can start to see this, like, historical narrative going on. It's really exciting. Yeah. So it has to do with time and space, um, something announcing itself from the spiritual world when the sun is at its standing still moment. Mm-hmm. And it has, in the tropical zodiac, this air element quality to it. Is it, is it always, it seems like, when I've heard it described for this year, maybe it's just all the um, other aspects surrounding it, but is it always something that brings, um, like, disruption? Or <laughs> makes them a bit chaotic? Or is it turmoil? Or is it more... Um, I mean, I think that, because it concentrates the, it focuses something. Right. right? So yeah. Whatever is, there's always stuff that we're having to deal with. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And so, yes, that, that can be a quality. Like what happened at the beginning of this year in January, the, there was sun, full moon, Mercury, Saturn, and Pluto all lined up at the same degree of the zodiac mm -hmm. in January. So that was like a portent, like, okay, everything is lined up, all the ducks are in a row, go. Yeah. And now look what happened. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa. Yeah. So then the planets moved on from each other, but then Jupiter swept through and met Pluto. So Jupiter is in this relationship to space and in the future. It's like, it's got like strong social conscience and Pluto comes very late in the discovery of the planets, I mean, it's of the outer planets. It wasn't discovered until the 1930s, and you could say that um, it's connected to deep regenerative forces. So when Pluto and Jupiter come together, there's you can see this massive social regeneration is wanting to take place. Mm. So Jupiter and Pluto are going to meet three times before Saturn and, and Jupiter meet. Right. So that's part of it. Then also on November 11th last year, 2019, um, Mercury transited the sun. That only happens 13 times a century. And Mercury is connected to communication. Mercury is also the escort of souls across the threshold. So it's like sounding a note that says, uh, there's, you know, there's a message coming. Humanity, yeah. make ready. Like something is about to take place. Yeah. And then at spring equinox in March, well, for us, the spring equinox for you, it would have been fall equinox. Um, in the morning sky, Mars was very close to Jupiter. Saturn was not too far away. The, the moon waned through that scene, and then it came new at equinox with Venus and Mercury at greatest elongation on either side of the sun and the moon, kind of creating this chalice mm. of the inner planets that are more connected to individual destiny, but a chalice to receive these outer planets, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn, that are connected to impulses for human freedom. Mm. So it's like we're trying to embody this in ourselves and busting out of systems that no longer serve yeah. or that haven't realized their highest potential. Mm. At least saying that as an American, you know, look, look, looking what's happening in our culture right now. It's like, you know, there's some ideals that were set there down at the beginning that haven't fully been realized. Mm. Um, it's the oppression that's happening to segments of the population that are feeling marginalized is no longer sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. And so the virus that swept around the world kind of quickened things. And then the comets. So there've been at least three comets in 2020 
not all of them visible to the naked eye. So first there was Comet Atlas and Comet Swan, which might have been visible in the southern hemisphere, then it crossed the equator into the north. And then Comet Neowise, which is visible for us in the north right now. But I'm working with the imagination that even though this is three different comets, it's one impulse. Right. So, so Comet Atlas came in, quickened really rapidly in uh, its, its magnitude, but then it broke up before it became visible. And all the astronomers were like, oh, no. But the moment it broke up, Comet Swan was discovered. And then it kind of like picked up the baton and did the next leg of the journey. So Atlas was from end of December to end of March. Mm -hmm. And then Comet Swan was discovered at the end of March. And it carried on until it went, got closest to the sun at the end of May. And then it dissipated. And then Comet Neowise finally broke through and has survived its passage by the sun and is now a naked eye comet. Mm. So you can see this, what the comets do, you know, we already had this, Mercury transited the sun, the planets lined up in January, we've had this meeting take place in March, and now we're getting ready for the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, but then add to the mix these three comets, and the way Rudolf Steiner describes the comets, it's as though, and also Elizabeth Breda, who was the person I talked about earlier that was his colleague that developed the, the mathematics and astronomy section of the School for Spiritual Science, is that comets are intimately connected to the destiny of the time in which they appear and that it's as though um, they pick up like unbridled astral forces ah. so they're kind of like a sweep they sweep through and they gather all this astrality onto themselves so they help yeah but also at summer solstice so it would have been winter solstice for you there was an eclipse of the sun and the way Rudolf Steiner describes this is that during a, a solar eclipse, the, these will forces are released into the spiritual world. And it's a good thing. It's like a safety valve on a steam engine. The steam uh -huh. builds up. And if you don't release the steam, you'll have an explosion. So a solar eclipse is like releasing the safety valve so you can let off the steam. And then the comet comes through and sweeps that all up. So that's that kind of what's going, really crude way to describe this just yeah. awesome picture of what's going on right now. Um, but it feels to me like it's like the spiritual, the celestial spiritual world is giving us this awesome opportunity for a bold awakening mm. to really honor and acknowledge the foundations of the things of the past that still serve, but to change up the ones that don't. Yeah, I yeah. hear you. Wow, that's a yeah. great picture of what's happening this year. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of a fire field, but yeah. Yeah, it's so. great. Um, do you have any other thoughts or imaginings on the on the year that you want to share before I ask you another question? Um, I could just share. There's one other piece at the risk of making it too complicated. No, go for but it. There's that I think is intimately involved in this picture, and it has to do with the planet Venus. Cool. And Venus right now is our morning star. I'm assuming it's morning star for you in the southern hemisphere as well, but projecting I... my thought to the southern hemisphere is not easy. <laughs> I think it is. Yeah, yeah. I think it is too. It's in the morning sky. Yeah. So Venus, um, over an eight-year period, Venus will make five retrograde loops, and then it will come back to the place where it started. Yeah. And so every eight years, Venus does this looping pattern five times. And this is where you get this pattern of the pentagram, the five-pointed star, in relationship to Venus. It has to do with its actual motion. Mm. And eight years ago, in 2012, in June of 2012, Venus transited the sun. So a transit, if it were the moon, we would say it's an eclipse because it looks like the planet is directly in front of the sun. Uh. But because... Venus is too far away and it's too small. It can't entirely block the sun. So it just looks like it moves right across the sun. But mm -hmm. with Venus, it only happens every 120 years or so. Oh. And it will happen in eight-year pairs. It happens at the beginning. Then Venus will make its five retrograde loops. And then it will happen at the end. And then it moves on. And that won't happen again for another 120 years. Hmm. So you can imagine when Venus transits the sun, it's almost like the planet is like Prometheus, the way the ancient Greeks described how Prometheus took fire from Helios and brought it to humanity on the earth. Mm. And it would be a civilizing force. Mm -hmm. And so 
when Venus transited the sun eight years ago, it's so, um, well, it started in 2004. So Venus, you could say, took the light of the sun, wove it as a pentagram around the earth, and then took it back to the sun at the concluding transit in 2012. Right. And now it's been eight years, and Venus just in June of this year, so just last month, completed the first pentagram since that time. And it feels to me very much like it happened at the macrocosmic level, and then the culmination of the next eight-year cycle brought it into the microcosm where we can experience it. And it would bring a, um, a certain kind of wholeness to being human. Venus is intimately connected to what lives in the heart of the human being, and also its rhythm strengthens the etheric body of the human being. Mm. Okay, so that's also going on this year where we have the comets sweeping up the astrality, we have the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, we've got Pluto and Jupiter meeting. I mean, it's just there's just this really awesome opportunity upon us this year, providing we don't get really divided through, well, at least in the United States, there's a great deal of divisiveness in the political climate and in people's responses to how to deal with the virus. And it's really easy to let the anti-social forces hold sway right now. Yeah. We have to work really hard to keep the warmth of the heart open and caring toward one another. Mm. Um, and I think that's what Venus is doing. Venus is saying, okay, human being, remember, it's from heart to heart. Yeah. That's, that's the foundation now. That's the ground you stand on is those relationships where the warmth streams from human being to human being. Indeed. Yeah. Mm, that's an interesting picture too. Thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> um, well, the only, I mean, I could ask you a lot of questions about astrology that would, I mean, all of this that would keep us going for a long time, but I think I better just ask you one more question about the okay. technicalities of it before it goes on too long <laughs> and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. somebody wanted to know somebody wanted to know about the importance of the north node in a, in a birth chart I assume could you talk a bit about that yeah so the node is a little hard to get a hold of because it's not an object it's just a point in space and it's a moving point and so earlier I had talked about how there was there's this idea that we each come from a star yeah. and that as we move through starry realms and then through the planetary spheres to the moon sphere before birth, we're carrying this spirit germ that we're cultivating. And you can imagine that in order to actually cross the threshold into the physical world, you have to find the door. And that door is the node. Ah, and so it's the point in space where the plane of the moon's orbit, not the body of the moon itself, but the plane of its orbit, intersects the plane of the Earth's orbit. So they're tilted a few degrees to one another. So the plane of the moon's orbit is intersecting the plane of Earth orbit at two places, once where the moon is coming up through the plane and once where the moon is going down through that plane. So they're called the north and the south node. Mm -hmm. We always look at them together. They stand exactly opposite one another, and they move in the opposite direction through the chart and through the sky than the planets do. So technically, they're always in retrograde motion. Right. And so things, when they're going retrograde, is uh, you could just kind of say superficially, it's it's allowing you to look back. So the node isn't necessarily about the past, but it's that doorway through which you can see something that you've done. So with the south node, it has to do with what you carried with you into the physical world. So it's the door that opens as your spirit germ is descending is the way you could describe it. Like it's the door through which you brought everything that you intended to unfold as your destiny in life. And the north node then in this picture would be what you intend to do with it, what you're reaching toward. And so oh. it kind of has this future aspect to it. So the south node is what I brought with me, kind of coming out of the past. North node is where I'm going and what I plan to do with it now. Mm -hmm. So it's like the axis of one's destiny. And it has a rhythm, like everything. Uh, the node of the moon comes back to the place where it was when you were born every 18 and a half years. Oh, okay. And so you can look in your life and see, like, okay, what happened at 18 and a half? 
and then again at 37.5, then again at, you know, you just do the math all the way through, and you can tell when the node is returning. Mm. And at that time, what Rudolf Steiner describes, but he says you really have to know that it's happening to be awake to it, so it's something we have to develop consciousness of, but that particularly in the dream life, you can have an experience as of energies rushing in from another world, like mm -hmm. rushing up into the life out of another world, because it's like the door opens at that place that you yourself rushed in, right? So it's really um, an awesome mystery. Yeah. And I like to think about the node as that doorway that's open. And so if you look at the life of, so you look at the life of a spiritual initiate like Rudolf Steiner, and when he died, the node of the moon was 11 degrees Leo in the tropical zodiac. And so now we're talking about somebody who has died in the physical life and is going back into the spiritual world. They also go through that door. And you could say that you take with you the fruits of your deeds through that door. And maybe you could imagine even like a little suitcase, you know, that you drop <laughs> off when you walk through the door so that anything that comes through that portal of 11 degrees Leo can be informed by what you left there, mm. right? So a soul that's incarnating through that degree can pick up what was gifted there by Rudolf Steiner, you could say. I mean, that's one way to say it. But so when you look at, like, in the Catholic Church, they celebrate the lives of the saints, and there are saints' days, and you have feasts on the saints' days. Well, oftentimes the, the day of the feast is on the day when a saint was martyred. Yeah, so yeah, they yeah. went back into the spiritual world. Well, the sun was at a particular degree of the zodiac, or the node was at a particular degree. And so when that recurs throughout history, or each year, when the sun comes back to that place, there's something resonant in that degree of the zodiac that belongs to what the individual was able to achieve on behalf of their humanity. Yeah. Ah. So, yeah, it's really awesome. Yeah, that's and, so cool. And then you can look... If you do um, a certain type of astrological practice and you're looking for past life experience, yeah, um, the node is significant in that kind of a calculation. It's one of the hermetic laws that must be met. The node has to comply with something in the former or future life in order to really see that there's a connection. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and then also the halfway points. Yeah. So when the node is halfway through its cycle, so around nine years, uh -huh. uh, is when it's as though then the, the door of the north node has swung all the way around and is open in the place where the south node was at birth. And it's like you get to look back at what you had intended. And then as the node moves on, it's like that door closes, and now you've got to be about the business of going toward the future in this life that you're in now. And my personal experience of the nodal return is that it's like you're walking in your own shoes and getting the getting the juice you need for the next leg of the cycle. Yeah, right. Yeah. So where can people – do you use a special kind of software for this? Because I'm just thinking I really want a chart of mine to be able to see where all this stuff is. Yeah, so you need to – you know, you can find a chart that will include the node in its um, – and it's display, yeah. but yeah, then you can get the you can get it online pretty easily if you know the time you were born, place you were born, the day you were born. Because yeah. you have to know the three things, and then it will calculate uh, where everything was when you were born. Is there one site or piece of software that you find trustworthy? Because I've used ones in the past, and sometimes it says that my um, the rising sign is. Sometimes it says it's Libra and sometimes it says it's um, Leo. And I'm like, which one is it? It's weird that it's changed. Oh, no, the moon sign. The moon sign yeah. has weirdly changed? Yeah, well, yeah, the moon with, yeah. So um, it depends probably on which, how it's calculating your time zone. Oh, right. And then there's like house systems. Yeah. I, use, I have an app on my phone that's just called Time Passages. Ah. It's really handy. Um, it's not very deep, but, you know, it just to calculate charts very quickly, but also to have them in my pocket when people are calling me to give you a look and see what I've got going on. You know? Yeah. And then um, I use the Starfire astro Astrosophy software that was developed by Peter Treadgold a long time ago 
and it hasn't been updated. Um, the program itself hasn't been updated for a long time, but I keep a very old laptop that has the program on it, and that's how I calculate my charts. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm sorry that I'm not like a, a wealth of information about reliable online sources. I can, I will message you some. I, I just can't. No, that's fine. The one that I used to look at. But Time Passage is a, is a fairly decent app that you can put on your phone. Mm -hmm. You can put in your information. It will give you short interpretations of the sign of your of your aspects and things. Um, cool. Yeah, and you can get an ephemeris which is a book that lists the positions of the planets every day of the year, mm -hmm. years. And so I have one for all of the 20th century and then for the first 50 years of the 21st century. And so that doesn't give you what your rising sign is, but you can look in there to see where the node was at the time that you were born and just where the planets were by degree. Mm. That's good, because I imagine there'll be lots of, I mean, that's kind of a question on top of this is like, where do you suggest that people, if they want to know more about all this, where would they go to start learning? Where would you suggest or what book do you reckon they should start reading? Yeah. <laughs> Which is the thing I wanted to ask Hazel Straker and all she did was chant my name to me. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> That's... Like you want me to answer a question that wasn't answered for me. It's really funny, but yeah. nonetheless, um, you know, I think it's really important to, in addition to having your chart and to getting conversant with your chart, like knowing where the sun was when you were born, knowing what phase the moon was in, and knowing what was rising up on the horizon in the east at the moment that you took your first breath, because that's kind of the mask that you wear, right? Like I was born with the sun in Aries, but I was born in the evening when the sun had already set and Scorpio was coming up on the horizon. So mm -hmm. I have the Scorpio mask that kind of might be the first thing that a person encounters when they see me, although behind it is this Aries sun, you know, but it's hidden because it hits them just below the horizon. So mm -hmm. knowing kind of that dynamic in your own personality is really important. And then the moon, because of its relationship to the feeling life and the emotional nature. So those three things, knowing where the sun was when you were born, knowing what was rising up on the horizon that's called the ascendant and then the position and phase of the moon. Um, and you can get that, you can get it through sites online where you just put in your information about time and date and place of birth. You could get it through this app that I just mentioned. Yeah. Um, so that's one place to start. The other thing that I think is really important is to get conversant with the night sky. Right. So to know what the constellations look like, because when we go seeking the stars, what you find out is that they are seeking us as well. So it's not a one-way street. Mm. And, and the only way to know that that's happening is to actually go out and expose yourself to the experience. And it's not like all of a sudden they show up and say, hey, it's good <laughs> to see you. It's not like that. Yeah. But you'll have a dream or a thought will come or somebody will say so like things that happen that awaken you to something. And when you listen long enough, now I've been at this for almost 40 years, and I can say that it's definitely, they, they speak, they're very loud, they're waiting for us to be recognized that we're in the conversation. Um, and so knowing the night sky helps that. Mm. And even if it's just that you decide, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to learn one constellation and watch what it does through the seasons and meet it again and again. You know, so that's not a real like immediate answer, but it's something that is, is a legitimate striving to really know the stars and to know our relationship. But then beyond that, so beyond knowing sun sign, rising sign, moon sign, and moon phase, and then also availing yourself of a map and a night sky, um, there are a lot of astrology books that you can get. Robert Hand is a pretty well-respected author of astrology books. Um, you can get in the United States, there's a publisher called Llewellyn's, and they sell a, a yearly almanac that gives you all of the aspects week by week, and then they give you a synopsis that has a little interpretation on it. It's called a daily planetary guide. Mm -hmm. That's all in the tropical zodiac. There's also the Star Wisdom Journal, that's mm. published by a group of astrosophers. That's all the, the sidereal zodiac. You can get that, I think, through um, 
Rudolf Steiner books. Yeah, right. So those are some places that you can look. And then, um, yeah, that, that might be where I would start. Mm -hmm. And then also something that I would do quite personally is just to ask yourself if you know any star names. And if you know them, how did you learn them? And why do they appeal to you? Why is that the one that's stuck? And then go find it in the sky and hold that question. What is it about this that, that drew me to it? You know, there's a beautiful myth, a beautiful uh, origin myth that comes out of, the, I, I want to say the word correctly, Maori, Maori people. Oh, Maori, like from New Maori. Zealand. Maori, yeah. Okay. yeah. About Tane. Tane, yeah, yeah. About the, um, oh, about how he places the stars on the cloak of his father after he's torn him apart from his, the earth mother. Yeah, the yeah, storm. yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful story. Mm. Um, so to really look in the in the indigenous culture, but also into one one's own cultural heritage, mm. and to see what really speaks to you, um, because there's something in that. There's an answer in it. There's a reason that that kind of sits there as something that you know, yeah. and it waits to be stirred up into activity. I love it. Yeah, by our by our placing our attention on it, and then it can guide us. Yeah, in in the most remarkable ways. Yeah, mm, I think that's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, is there anything um, else you want to add to all this before we wrap it up and I talk about where people can find more information about what you do? You know, I I think that was a lot. I think it's a lot to to try to conceive of but mm. I really appreciate your asking me so I thank you for that and I guess I would just like to end with a, a beautiful quote from Rudolf Steiner that really is strengthening for me particularly when I feel like things are getting really challenging great um, and he says uh, it's very short just one line the more abundantly the harmony of the cosmos fills the soul the more peace and harmony there will be on the earth And I feel very strongly that striving to know the stars and our relationship to them is peace work. This is how we bring peace and harmony into the world. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's deep and important work to find a star, to learn its name, to figure out why it draws your attention, and to know where it is in your life. Mm -hmm. And then to keep adding stars to it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I like that. Thank you. So yeah. if, if people want to connect with you, do you have, where's the best place for them to find, um, find out more about what you do? So I have a website that's called Storytellers Night Sky. Mm -hmm. And I do a weekly radio program that's just two minutes about what's happening in the sky in the Northern Hemisphere for the week. Um, and so mainly that site is where I put it's just the scripts for my radio segment, and there's audio access there. But I will also um, put up, like, I would put a link to this podcast or to webinars that I've done. So you can find other presentations that I've done there at that website. Great. Then I also have a Facebook page by the same name, The Storyteller's Night Sky. I'm much, uh, that's much more current just because it's so easy to post on Facebook every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, so I use it in that respect. Um, I do have a personal page on Facebook, but I don't use it as much because mm -hmm. I'm more interested in talking about the stars and, and uh, sharing information. It's not as esoteric as you might expect because I don't feel that social media is the place for social, for deep esotericism, mm -hmm. but it's just points in a direction like here's a thing that you could be thinking about. And then I'm also on Instagram. You yeah. and I have communicated there. <laughs> uh, so it's Star Mares. That Star Mares is my address there. And then, um, you know, through any of those portals, you can email me if you have a specific question. Mm. I do read charts, but I don't do it in the summer season. So we're in our summer right now. Right. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I yeah, I keep a pretty active but a pretty varied schedule. I do cruises. I do 
webinars, I do chart readings, I do, you know, it's, it's kind of all over. The stars are everywhere, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't limit myself in that respect. That's great. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today and to talk to us about all you have. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your interest and for asking me and for the opportunity. It's really been wonderful. Yes. It's easy to talk about yourself when you're in Aries. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'll have to make sure that I book more Aries in because <laughs> it makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, well, Aries and Gemini, you know, fire and air, they get along really well. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and find that comet of comet. Yes, I'll be out looking at the beautiful skies again tonight. So I'll, I'll be out late. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks, really Mary. Yeah.